During World War II, Germany fielded numerous elite SS divisions, among them, the well-known European 5th Viking Division. History also recognizes another European division of comparable stature called Nordland, specifically the 11th SS Nordland Panzergrenadier Division. This division gained a reputation as an elite force, actively engaging in combat across a significant expanse, from Leningrad to the pivotal Battle of Berlin, including the iconic Reichstag defense. Strap on your helmets and join us today at History at War, as we delve deep into the captivating story and combat of the Nordland Division. In the intriguing backdrop of February 1943, after the demise of Stalingrad and the fall of the Sixth Army, a pivotal directive from Hitler materialized, giving rise to the concept of an SS division comprising foreign volunteers. As the sands of March drifted in, the SS Panzergrenadier Regiment Nordland, initially a Scandinavian volunteer regiment, was meticulously excised from the folds of the SS Division Viking. This deliberate separation marked the birth of the nucleus for an entirely new division, an endeavor laden with historical significance. Notably, the two Panzergrenadier regiments that formed the core of Nordland bore titles intricately woven with the fabric of their recruits' origins. The SS Panzergrenadier Regiment 23 and its counterpart, the SS Panzergrenadier Regiment 24 Danmark, an evocative nod to Denmark, mirrored a determined effort to reflect the diversity of the volunteers' homelands. However, as the autumn of 1943 embraced the division upon its arrival at the Eastern Front, a surprising revelation emerged. Contrary to the title's intent, a staggering majority of almost 80% of Nordland's personnel were composed not of Scandinavian nationals, but rather a blend of Reichsdeutsche, hailing from Germany itself, and Volksdeutsche originating from Romania. Who'd thought Germany would have an elite division comprised of mostly Romanians? Shows how complex World War II really was at times. Following its establishment in Germany, the division became a part of the 3rd Germanic SS Panzer Corps, led by Obergruppenführer Felix Steiner. Subsequently, it was relocated to Croatia, where it joined forces with the SS Volunteer Legion Nederland, Netherlands. The division's engagement in active military operations commenced in September 1943, targeting Yugoslav partisans. The division was thrown into some heavy battles against the partisans, with some of the division facing casualties. By the middle of October 1943, the division undertook destructive actions by setting fire to and pillaging numerous Serb villages situated in Croatia's Banja region. Concurrently, it played a role in the establishment of a local collaborationist Chetnik militia. The Chetnik militia were anti-communist and collaborated with the 11th SS within Yugoslavia, engaging in many different battles against partisans across the region. Having earned their combat stripes in the Balkans, the Nordland Division and the other units comprising the 3rd SS Panzer Corps found themselves on a new battleground, the frigid environs near Leningrad. The year was 1944, and in the wake of the Soviet counteroffensive, these battle-hardened troops were dispatched northwards with a crucial mission to quell the looming threat of a Soviet breakout. The stakes were high, and the impending danger demanded their swift intervention. As January's bitter winds swept across the landscape, the Nordland Division hastily established their positions around Leningrad. Yet, their respite was short-lived. The Soviet forces, driven by massive determination, shattered through the beleaguered German siege lines with an explosive force. Not even the resolute Scandinavians of the Nordland Division could hold back the surge, as the very foundations of the German encirclement crumbled under the weight of the Soviet advance. In a desperate struggle to regain control, the Nordland Division found themselves thrust into an unforgiving battle. The situation demanded a rearguard action that spanned a grueling 20 miles as they fought tirelessly to stem the tide and prevent the Soviet forces from breaking through to even more vital ground. The landscape became a crucible of conflict, marked by the stark contrast of snow-covered fields and the fiery chaos of battle. The Division Nordland was completely around Leningrad. With every step backward, the Nordland Division poured their resolve into the fight and defense of their positions, covering key defensive sectors with other German units. However, the odds were daunting, and the Soviet onslaught was relentless. Despite their defense, the Nordland Division was compelled to yield ground, inch by agonizing inch, as they conducted their rearguard action towards the critical stronghold of Oranienbaum. A mere seven days later, at Oranienbaum, 
The unfolding events took on a frenzied urgency as the division undertook a hasty retreat. The Soviet forces were on a speed run, smashing into the German defenses with such ferocity that the division had no choice but to fall back yet again, covering an astonishing distance of 65 miles toward the west. Their destination was the strategic Baltic seaport of Narva, nestled along the rugged Estonian coastline. This rapid shift in position was emblematic of the ever-shifting nature of war, where the imperative to adapt quickly could spell the difference between victory and defeat. The intricate dance of retreat saw the Nordland division traverse a challenging expanse, the landscape morphing from one scene of conflict to another. The relentless pace of their withdrawal mirrored the intensity of battle, as they navigated through treacherous terrain and inclement weather. Their journey towards Narva was a test of endurance, as they pressed on to reach this vital port, which held the promise of resupply and a potential avenue of strategic advantage. The backdrop of this withdrawal was the broader theater of operations led by Army Group North. The Narva River, a natural barrier with strategic significance, emerged as the focal point of their defense. Here, amidst the river's flowing waters and the sprawling banks, the remnants of Army Group North orchestrated their defensive stance. The aim was twofold, to halt the advancing Soviet forces in their tracks and to regroup for an impending counteroffensive that could potentially turn the tides of the conflict. The Narva River, a symbol of both protection and opportunity, became the nexus around which the division's fate and the broader military strategy converged. The clash of opposing forces intensified on these grounds, with each side jockeying for control and supremacy. The riverbanks saw the ebb and flow of conflict, as the Nordland division, battle-weary yet resolute, found themselves at the forefront of this pivotal juncture. Renowned in some historical circles as the Battle of the European SS, the Battle of Narva stands as a vivid tableau of multinational resistance against the relentless Soviet forces. This pivotal confrontation brought together combatants hailing from Germany, Norway, Denmark, Holland, Belgium, and Estonia, all united in their resolute determination to fend off the vengeful advance of the Soviets. The battlegrounds around Narva echoed with the clash of ideologies and the convergence of diverse nations under the banner of a common cause. The 11th SS Nordland was thrown into the mix of this ferocious battle. The Nordland division, infused with fighters from these diverse European nations, played a pivotal role. Their involvement added another layer of complexity to the narrative, embodying the fusion of nationalities within the Waffen SS. The Nordland division, comprised of men from these different origins, showcased their remarkable adaptability and unity in the face of a shared threat from the Soviet forces. The struggle for control saw repeated attempts by the Soviet forces to breach the defensive lines held by this multinational coalition. Rivers and lakes that separated the combatants became contentious battlegrounds as the Soviets launched audacious crossings in their quest for victory. Yet, time and again, their efforts were met with fierce resistance and steadfast defense. One notable instance was the ambitious landing force at Marikule in February 1944. The Nordland forces alone, undeterred in demonstrating exceptional skill, annihilated this entire attempt, turning the tide against the Soviet incursion in this battle at Narva. The incredible resilience of the defenders became unmistakably evident as the months wore on. The Soviet forces, numbering around 200,000 strong, faced an arduous challenge in displacing a much smaller contingent of 50,000 defenders. This statistic alone speaks volumes about the determination, strategic prowess, and unshakable resolve of the multinational forces who held their ground. With the weight of war pressing upon them, the Nordland division embarked on a tactical withdrawal to a new defensive position, the formidable Tannenberg Line. The journey was one marked by careful maneuvering and strategic calculation, as they sought to regroup and fortify against the relentless advance of the enemy. As the Nordland soldiers marched towards the Tannenberg Line, Upon reaching the Tannenberg Line, the Nordland Division found themselves in the company of already established defensive positions on the commanding Orphanage Hill. Situated 15 miles to the west of Narva, this strategic vantage point became their bastion against the surging Soviet forces. Here, amidst the rolling terrain and the looming threat of conflict, the Division's fate would unfold. However, even amidst the strategic advantages of the Tannenberg Line, the tides of fortune began to shift. July 1944 marked a turning point. The division suffered the loss of key figures, including SS Gruppenführer Schultz and the commanders of both Panzergrenadier regiments, who fell in combat on the 29th of July. 
These losses were profound and felt deeply within the division, as they epitomized the sacrifices made in the relentless pursuit of victory. On that very same fateful day, their perseverance shone through as they confronted the enemy with remarkable courage. Nordland decisively destroyed over 100 Soviet tanks while in this defensive position. Yet, even as the Nordland division held steadfast in their defense of the Tannenberg line, the reality of war's unrelenting momentum cast a shadow over their efforts. The approaching summer heralded a shift in strategy. Recognizing the need for strategic realignment and preservation, an order was issued for the division's evacuation to the lands of Latvia. This decision, while strategic, marked a poignant chapter in their journey, as they bid farewell to hard-fought positions and ventured into new territories yet again. Just a mere month had passed since the Nordland division arrived with a solemn resolve to defend the historic Latvian capital of Riga. But the onslaught of the Soviets proved relentless. Riga, a city steeped in history, succumbed to the unrelenting advance, and the division was once again faced with the somber reality of retreat. Another evacuation, the fluid nature of warfare, became a necessity. This time, the Nordland division was redirected to a new theater of operations, the Kurland Pocket. The sprawling expanse of this region became their temporary sanctuary, a place where they would wage a battle of attrition to afford retreating German forces the precious gift of time. As the days grew shorter and winter's chill settled in, the division found themselves entrenched in a series of holding actions that epitomized their defense. In the midst of the fall and early winter of 1944, the Kurland Pocket became a crucible of conflict. The Nordland Division, alongside a backdrop of frost-covered landscapes, engaged in a relentless struggle of delaying actions. These were battles marked by the determination to stave off the enemy's advance, giving other German formations the opportunity to escape via sea routes to northern Germany. Each engagement was very brutal, etching their story into the very fabric of this unforgiving theater of war. Through the frigid days and moonlit nights, the division's soldiers became embroiled in a tense dance with the enemy. The Curlin Pocket was a place where strategic choices were balanced with the courage of those who stood on the front lines. The accounts of these battles are marked by tales of endurance, resourcefulness, and camaraderie, as the Nordland division forged bonds that could only be cemented amidst the trials of combat. This division Nordland was being relied on by other divisions to hold this line. They had a ton of pressure not to fold. Finally, after months of steadfast resistance, a new chapter was set to unfold. The dawn of January 1945 brought with it a significant shift. The Nordland Division was finally withdrawn from the Kurland Pocket. Their journey led them to Libau, where they were prepared for another sea voyage, this time to the heart of Pomerania in Stettin. This move marked a transition, a new theater of operations that would come to define the final months of their wartime journey. Nordland disembarked in Siechin, also known as Stettin, with the Panzer Battalion Hermann von Salza being directed to Gotenhafen for necessary refurbishments. Towards the end of January, the Nordland Division received new orders, finding themselves placed under the command of Steiner's 11th SS Panzer Army, a force that was rapidly coalescing in preparation for the defense of Berlin. As the calendar flipped to early February of 1945, the freshly refurbished Panzer Battalion made its return to the division's ranks. Alongside this, a trickle of reinforcements commenced their arrival, bolstering the division's strength in the face of the ongoing conflict. On the pivotal date of February 15, 1945, the Nordland Division was moved to a staging area designated for the execution of Operation Solstice, Sonnenwende, the Pomeranian Offensive. This ambitious offensive strategy had initially been envisaged by General Oberst Heinz Guderian as a wide-ranging, concerted assault spanning the entirety of the front lines. However, the plan underwent alterations at the hands of Hitler, being scaled down to a localized counterattack. Starting from the region of Rietz, Nordland launched an offensive aimed at the besieged city of Arnswalde. At the beginning of the attack, the Nordland division successfully caught the enemy off guard swiftly moving forward to reach the shores of Lake Ina across all sectors, smashing the Soviet defenses. Nevertheless, as the Soviets became aware of the unfolding situation, their resistance became more formidable, causing the progression to decelerate. By February 17th, the division successfully arrived at Arnswald, providing relief to the weary defenders. 
In the subsequent days, the town was secured, and efforts were made to evacuate all the remaining civilians to the west. However, the division's advance was hindered by robust Soviet counteroffensives shortly after, prompting Steiner to cancel the offensive and retract the three SS Panzer Corps. Between February 23rd and 28th, the third SS Panzer Corps executed a gradual retreat towards the region encompassing Stargard and Stettin, Zhekin, along the northern banks of the Oder River. On the 1st of March, 1945, the Soviets initiated a massive attack against the German forces positioned in Pomerania. In a matter of hours, the German defensive line crumbled. Despite engaging in intense combat while retreating, the Nordland Division along with the rest of the, the three, SS Panzer Corps managed to inflict significant casualties on the Soviet troops. However, by the 4th of March, the division found itself retreating towards Altdam, which marked the final defensive position to the east of the Oder River. By the night of the 7th and 8th of March, the division had regrouped in the vicinity of Altdam. Over the subsequent two weeks, Nordland tenaciously held on to the town they were engaged in the most brutal fighting, enduring both substantial losses and causing heavy casualties to their opponents. On the 19th of March, the battered defenders were forced to withdraw behind the Oder River. The Danmark and Norge regiments fought valiantly until almost all their personnel were exhausted. Subsequently, the division received orders to move back to the region west of Schwetbad Freinwalde in order to undergo reorganization and recovery. The intention was to reclassify Nordland as a panzer division. However, this plan was thwarted by the ongoing wartime circumstances. As a result, Nordland continued its military operations functioning as a Panzer Grenadier Division. In order to replenish its depleted ranks, the division received new soldiers from various sources, including the Luftwaffe, Kriegsmarine, Waffen-SS, and even a limited number of individuals volunteering from the British Free Corps. Notably among these reinforcements were a battalion consisting of 300 personnel from the 33rd Waffen Grenadier Division of the SS Charlemagne, comprising French SS Volunteers, the Spanish SS Volunteer Company, and the acquisition of additional vehicles. On the 27th of March 1945, the division, alongside the rest of the three, SS Panzer Corps, relocated to the northern area of Angermunde, the division was next assigned one of its most challenging battles to date, the Battle of Berlin and the defense of the Reichstag. On the 16th of April, Nordland received orders to rejoin the front lines to the east of Berlin. Despite having recently received reinforcements, the division still suffered from significant shortages in personnel. With the exception of the French and Spanish elements, many of the new recruits had limited or no prior experience in combat. Nevertheless, for the defense of the Oder River, they were provided additional support in the form of the formidable tanks from the 503rd Schwerer SS Panzer Abteilung. By the time Nordland had regrouped within Berlin, the 503rd Schwerer SS Panzer Abteilung had deployed a total of 12 Koenigstieger Panzer VI AOSFB heavy tanks. Starting on the 16th of April 1945, the Soviet forces launched their offensive with the aim of capturing Berlin. The 11th SS Freiwilligen Panzer Grenadier Division Nordland received orders to position themselves to the south of Frankfurt on the Oder River. However, due to a shortage of vehicles and fuel, the division found itself situated in the vicinity of Strasbourg, which is near Berlin. Consequently, it was reassigned to the LVI, Panzer Corps. 48 hours later, the division assumed defensive stances in preparation to counter the advancing Soviet forces. Following that, the fatigued division was gradually forced to retreat again, initially through Malsdorf, and eventually back into the city of Berlin. During this period, Nordland engaged in some retreating firefights, while the divisions tried to find their footing in Berlin. Keep in mind the many divisions transporting to Berlin for an immediate defensive position, and faced many issues with leadership. The situation was a complete mess. Due to this, the division's personnel had dwindled significantly, reaching a mere strength of 1,500 men. On the 25th of April, Brigadefuhrer Gustav Krukenberg assumed command of Berlin, Defense Sector C, a role that encompassed the Nordland Division. This change in leadership coincided with the removal of the division's former commander, Joachim Ziegler. Additionally, the inclusion of French SS personnel provided a significant boost to the Nordland Division. 
This was particularly important as the Norge and Danmark Panzergrenadier regiments within the division had suffered substantial losses in the intense combat. Each of these regiments now roughly equated to the strength of a battalion. April 26th, Soviet combat groups pushed deep into Neukölln, a district of Berlin. Brigadefuhrer Gustav Krukenberg, now leading the defenders of Sector C, devised a tactical plan to consolidate their forces around Hermannplatz, a crucial location. In a strategic move, Krukenberg established his command center within the confines of the Opera House, using the iconic structure as a bastion of command and control. In the midst of the Nordland Division's withdrawal towards Hermannplatz, a remarkable episode unfolded. The French SS contingent, aided by approximately 100 Hitler Youth members accompanying them, exhibited exceptional combat prowess. They engaged the enemy with Panzerfausts, handheld anti-tank weapons, and managed to decimate an astonishing 14-plus Soviet tanks. This daring action showcased the determination of these fighters, regardless of their age, to defend their position at all costs. In a separate encounter, a machine gun emplacement strategically positioned near the Halenzy Bridge emerged as a crucial bulwark against the Soviet advance. This steadfast position held firm for an impressive 48-hour period, spraying mercilessly upon Soviet advance, significantly impeding the progress of the Soviet forces in that specific area. In response to the evolving threat, the remaining armored assets of the Nordland Division were pressed into action. Consisting of eight formidable Tiger II tanks from the 503rd Schwer SS Panzer Abteilung, along with several assault guns, this armored contingent received orders to take up defensive positions within the Tiergarten area. This tactical maneuver aimed to consolidate their forces and establish a formidable defense line to counter the relentless Soviet advance. On the 27th of April, a day etched in the annals of history, the remnants of the Nordland Division engaged in a spirited, albeit ultimately futile, defense. As the relentless Soviet advance continued, these fighters were gradually compelled to retreat, finding themselves pushed back into the very heart of the central government district, encompassing Defense Sector Z. The government district became a crucible of resistance, where each building, each street, bore witness to the clash between steadfast defenders and the encroaching forces. Amidst this unforgiving landscape, the defenders' last stand led them to the iconic Reichstag and the imposing Reich Chancellery. These monumental structures, once symbols of power and authority, now became the epicenter of a battle for survival. The battle-hardened survivors of the Nordland Division, joined by French and Spanish, even Latvian and others who had rallied to their cause, held fast within these historical edifices. For days that felt like an eternity, they endured, confronting wave after wave of enemy assaults. The Reichstag, steeped in history, witnessed a new chapter being written, one defined by the fierce struggle for its halls and corridors. Inside the Reichstag, Amidst the shattered remnants of what was once a grand parliamentary chamber, the defenders held their ground with tenacity. The walls echoed with the clatter of gunfire, the shouts of defiance, and the thunderous explosions that rocked the very foundations of the building. In the vicinity of the Reich Chancellery, courtyards and corridors became battlegrounds. Every corner, every room, bore the scars of combat. German soldiers were defending room by room from the Soviets, the once polished marble floors now bore the marks of combat boots, and the grand halls reverberated with the sounds of combat. Despite the odds stacked against them, Nordland clung to their posts, fighting with everything they had. Their resilience became emblematic of the larger struggle, of a city, a nation, and an ideology on the brink of collapse, running low on ammunition. The last remnants of the Norland Division once a large, formidable force now just down the last men defending their capital city. On the 30th of April, following the announcement of Hitler's self-inflicted demise, immediate instructions were given to individuals capable of doing so, urging them to make a decisive move. In response, an initiative was set in motion. The escape from the confines of the Reich Chancellery region commenced at precisely 11 p.m. on the 1st of May. Through the war-torn streets and amidst the smoldering remnants of a once great city, these groups set out under the cover of darkness. The path they chose was one fraught with uncertainty, yet it was the only path left for those who remained. This endeavor comprised ten distinct primary groups, all of which had to journey in a northwestward trajectory, aiming for the Mecklenburg region. 
Amid the tumultuous events surrounding Berlin, fierce combat persisted unabated, with particular intensity witnessed around the vicinity of the Weidendammer Bridge. Notably, the remaining elements of the Nordland Division, under the leadership of Krukenberg, displayed resolute determination amidst the chaos. The 503rd Schwerer SS Panzer Abteilung's final Tiger tank was tragically incapacitated while attempting to traverse the Weidendammer Bridge, a symbol of the arduous struggle that had characterized the division's final days. In the midst of this struggle, a handful of small determined groups succeeded in reaching the American forces stationed on the western bank of the Elbe River. However, the majority of individuals, including those from Krukenberg's contingent, found themselves trapped within the formidable Soviet encirclement. Krukenberg, demonstrating his skill in war, managed to navigate through the perils of the battlefield and reach Dahlem. There, he found refuge in an apartment, concealing himself for an entire week. Yet the weight of the circumstances ultimately caught up with him. Faced with the reality of the situation, he made the decision to surrender. By May 2nd, it was the end for the Norland Division. The fighting came to a stop. The lingering pockets of opposition were systematically cleared by the advancing Red Army. Around 80,000 prisoners of war were compelled to march eastward under the supervision of their captors. Among these, numerous SS soldiers, driven by their steadfast commitment to their pledge to Hitler, had already met their fate in battle, or through self-inflicted means. Throughout the Battle of Berlin, Hitler's refrain had been to fight to the death. However, with Hitler's own demise, this imperative shifted. For those who managed to survive this tumultuous period, their journey towards safety often led them to the lines of the Western Allies. However, their loyalty to their cause and their binding oath carried a bitter consequence. The majority found themselves handed over to their home nations, facing legal proceedings for their perceived treachery. This culminated in a range of outcomes, including imprisonment and for a few, the ultimate penalty of death. And there we have it. The complete chronicle of the 11th SS Nordland, a captivating segment of history. We sincerely hope you found this journey as enjoyable as we did in crafting it, and that you've uncovered something new along the way. From the harrowing events in Leningrad, to the climactic struggles in Berlin, we've traversed a path that vividly contrasts Hitler's fight to the death directive, with the momentous shift brought by his own downfall provides a profound window into the intricate tapestry of human conflict, ideologies, and the unstoppable march of time. Don't forget to explore our Patreon below for even more exclusive content and connect with us on Instagram. As we venture onward through history, unearthing the stories that have sculpted our world, we invite you to join us on this compelling journey. Remember to like, subscribe, and stay tuned for more enlightening explorations from history at war. See you guys soon.